Um, but uh, good morning and welcome. My name is John Little and I'm the data science librarian in the Center for Data and Visualization Sciences, which is a department that's embedded in the Duke University Libraries. Uh, <clears throat> this is part two of a two-part workshop. Uh, you may have registered only for part two. Somewhere in the registration, it asked that you'd be familiar with the stuff that we covered yesterday. And so we may move a little quicker today, but um, <clears throat> everything that I've done is recorded. So if, you co if we cover stuff that is unclear to you, I'll, I'll give you some tips on how you can kind of get up to speed. Uh, this workshop is... Uh, we're, what we're going to cover today is visualization with ggplot2, which is a library part of the tidyverse packages in, uh, in R. And we will cover inter interactive visualizations as well, mostly static visualizations, but then how to turn those, there's a quick step on how to turn those into interactive visualizations. We'll cover um, pivoting your data, so making it wide or tall. We'll cover um, joining data using a, a function called left join. And we will cover uh, an, a very basic introduction to doing linear regressions in R. And um, I sent information out in advance just to remind you about preparation work uh, for this semester, but all the workshops are recorded. So if you go to online learning, you can get, um, of course, it's for some reason the web server is slow at, at the moment, but from this online learning page, you will get links to uh, recordings of previous whole workshops covering things like spatial analysis and reproducibility and Git and um, Python and how to do good visualizations and charts. Um, you can see that you can, for example, under data science, you can expand the R and tidyverse, and there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but there's things in every category. And what we'll share there is uh, slides if they're available, data if we can share it, um, and video uh, recordings, streamings of previous workshops. So you can always go back there and then you can you can look at these. In addition to that, I um, host uh, what's called the R, what I call the R Fun site, uh, which stands for Are We Having Fun Yet, which is sort of a uh, predilection that the R community has with the name of their programming language R. They like to, to use it and kind of make fun of it and use it in innovative ways. Um, but this site uh, includes little modules to all kinds of different workshops, different things that you can do with R. You're welcome to use that. That will also include video and code and slides. Um, there is a section here on ggplot visualization, as well as um, we're mostly working off of this first module, Quick Start with R. So people who were here yesterday would have already looked at these two embedded videos. And today we'll cover this one. And, and this is really just a repeat of um, the last couple minutes is from minute 20 to like minute 25 is about regression. But here's the section right here. You know, if I say things about joins and, it, and you want to brush up on it, or it's been six months and you want a reminder, you can go watch this brief video where there's more information about assignments and pipes or how to use RStudio IDE or how to install packages or what R Markdown, which we talked about yesterday, but we won't talk about much today. Um, you can get more information from all those, plus this link to this playlist, which includes all these videos at the bottom, there are two links to full recordings of, of the part one, part two workshop. Not necessarily from yesterday and today, but um, full recordings nonetheless. So um, let's see, I think I covered that. Oh, I like to start out, if you'll give me your attention, I like to start out with a land acknowledgement. So um, I would like to take a moment to honor the land in Durham, North Carolina. Duke University sits on the ancestral lands of the Shikori, the Eno, and the Catawba people. 
This institution of higher education is built on land stolen from those peoples. These tribes were here before the colonizers arrived. Additionally, this land is borne witness to over 400 years of the enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African people and their descendants. Recognizing this history is an honest attempt to break out beyond persistent patterns of colonization and to rewrite the erasure of indigenous and black people. Black peoples, there is value in acknowledging the history of our occupied spaces and places. And I hope we can glimpse an understanding of these histories by recognizing the origins of our collective journeys. So um, thank you for listening to that. Um, for those of you who are just logging in, this that's a land acknowledgement, but we were really not gonna talk about social justice issues in today's workshop. We're just gonna talk about R and how to visualize, um, how to transform data and how to do some quick regressions. Uh, but I, all I asked really is that you think about injustice and if there's something you can use from these workshops that will help you fix an injustice, then that would be really that, well, I couldn't ask for anything more. Um, but moving on, this is who's in the class today uh, from by graduate status or academic status and from various disciplines. Looks very similar to what we had yesterday. Um, this chart was done um, obviously by in R by pulling in some data from the survey form that was done on Google Drive, uh, Google Forms is what it's called. And then you can flip a switch on Google Forms that will generate a spreadsheet of data. And then you can use R to ingest that data and write some code to, uh, you know, to visualize it or to analyze it in whatever way you want. We're gonna talk about how you generate a graph like this today. And um, one of the things that's kind of nice about ggplot is that it is a whole grammar for how you can describe graphics, right? So we're, we won't start out with this full complexity of the grammar, but notice that uh, this plot and this plot are the same. The only difference really is one line of code right here which totally changes the look of the entire uh, plot, right? It puts it into facets. And that's one of the things about ggplot is that with this grammar, you can start to describe layers of graphics. And once you can describe one kind of plot, for example, a bar plot or a scatter plot, then uh, you can use that to describe all kinds of other, to describe and generate other layers, different kinds of plots. So regression lines or, violin plots or box plots. It all starts to work together. And that's a really nice feature. Be a web browser over here and open up the first GitHub repository. And the other GitHub repository is right there. All right, so GitHub repositories, uh, we downloaded these yesterday. If you downloaded them yesterday, you do not need to do this again. If you're new to this workshop, I'm going to do this twice. The steps are important. Uh, you can use our studio to negotiate all of this to where it's really convenient. But uh, that initial configuration of doing that is, is a little bit beyond scope of today. So instead, for downloading these repositories, which are our studio project folders, um, we'll just do it the sort of the, the always works method. Right. So opening up the uh, RFUN flipped repository, I'm gonna click on this green button. And when I do that, where it says code, when I do that, um, there is a context menu and I'm gonna click download zip. And eventually what we're gonna do after it's fully downloaded is we're going to, um, anyway, uh, we will expand these repositories in just a moment, which is important. So I'm gonna flip over to the other repository do the same thing, click on code and then click download zip. And these will download to wherever your system puts download files. Uh, you, most people generally know where that is. I know in, in my case, um, <laughs> thanks, nice Morad. Um, so uh, I know in my case, I'm downloading them to uh, the download folder and I can just click on this context menu, menu and click show in folder. And that will bring up my file manager, which 
uh, in Windows. It's called the Windows Explorer. You'll notice I've done this a few times. Now, this next step is actually also important. It's important to expand the zipped compressed folder uh, because we may save things back into that folder, right? So I'm not 100% certain how you do that in, in Mac world, but I've never had any Mac people ask me about this. So I was, I'm assuming it's pretty, pretty convenient and straightforward, like you just double click on it. But for Windows people, you can right click on that file and choose extract all. You may actually, and you can put it anywhere you want. Uh, let's go ahead and put this on the desktop and select folder and extract. If you have a, a WinZip or a 7-zip or something like that, it may work a little bit differently. But in any case, right click and extract all. And let me put that on my desktop and maybe give it a different name. Oh, well, it's gonna do the same thing, but it'll be fine in either case. I'm gonna click um, skip these files. And hopefully we that won't cause us any trouble. But now what I have um, on my desktop is I have those two folders. And these folders are our project folders. And you would have in the email gotten a um, got an email that would have directed you to this particular GitHub repository. You may not have downloaded that data, uh, but once you download it, in order to open it up as an RStudio project, you can find a file called workshop underscore rfun underscore flipped, which is a uh, R project folder. Uh, we're not going to start there, however. We're going to start over here in the exercises, which is not something you've seen before. And um, this is a slightly different view of the files, but you're just looking for an icon that looks like this. It looks like a R with a box in it. Um, and if you just double click on that, it will load this RStudio project into its own discrete instance of RStudio. I think I may have yesterday increased the, the, the um, font view of my RStudio. I just want to double check that. You don't have to do this part. Yeah, I'm up there at 150%. That should be fine. Hopefully you can all see this well. And yesterday we covered uh, 01A Deplier, which was, Deplier is a package, part of the Tidyverse, similar in some ways to um, ggplot, which is also part of the Tidyverse. Um, Deplier is used primarily for manipulating and wrangling data. Today we're gonna use ggplot, which is primarily for generating plots, a grammar of graphics, and we'll also use TidyR, which is useful for tidying data, but mostly for um, uh, pivoting. I think that's right. I think pivot is in TidyR and left join is in deplier. Anyway, the, it doesn't really matter because we'll load just one. We'll just load the library Tidyverse, which when you load Tidyverse, it actually loads eight related Tidyverse packages at once. So Tidyverse is, the, is sort of the conceptual name for what they refer to as an opinionated set of packages that all work well together. They use the word opinionated intentionally because what they're trying to say is, we think those people who develop Tidyverse, we think this is a, the best way to use R and we think that it is, um, and it's, they've certainly put a lot of effort into making it consistent across packages, not only for the, how the functions work, uh, but for the documentation, which is all online. Um, but they also recognize it's not the only way to use R. There are lots of people who use base R and you can use any one of these Tidyverse packages with or without RStudio and with or without the rest of the Tidyverse, right? So if you're a base R person, you can still use ggplot without using the rest of Tidyverse if that's what you wish to do. Uh, we're going to start, however, today in this 01B viz and, and EDA for exploratory uh, data analysis. And so I'm just going to click on that one file right there, and that should bring up a file in my editor. You have probably something similar. I'm going to drag this up to the top so that we're looking at that, and I'm going to make this so that it's just one screen, which hopefully will be easier for you to see. 
And uh, just quick review, the top seven lines are part of what's called a YAML header of an R markdown script. And that, since it's an R markdown script, that means for the most part, I can intersperse code with prose. Uh, you'll see some, some formatting code here that is, is actually referred to as R markdown. If I click on this little compass icon in the upper right-hand corner of my editor, um, I can actually shift to a visual editor, which some of you may like better. It may require, it may download a package in order for that to happen. Um, but I'm not gonna, so you can see the structure of the R markdown, right? Things, some things are bold and some things are links and uh, there's a bulleted list and there's um, second level headers and then interspersed amongst all of that um, formatting are different code chunks, these little gray boxes, each of which you can run separately um, just by clicking on the little green button. I'm going to actually switch back to the text view because it's more comfortable for me. But I will point out two things. If you go under help and click uh, markdown quick reference, you can get some information about how to, how to use these typesetting codes. And also, if you wanted to create a new markdown document, you could just click on this little plus right here. And depending on your needs, is going to depend on which one of these you choose. You're choosing, you're creating a, a new file, a script file. And for my part, I almost always start in our notebook, and then I may choose to change the output to something else. The output is designated right here, and you can make that output be a PDF file or a web page or a dashboard or the list, an ebook. The list goes on. We won't cover all of that today. There are modules in the R Fund site about some of those things, and I'm happy to answer questions about those. Well, we will cover today. Oh, one more thing. Let me expand back out my to the four quadrant view. Um, there are three libraries that we're going to run, and one of them is Gapminder, which you may or may not have. Uh, you may or may not have Skimmer. If you loaded this um, editor and you don't have those libraries, a lot of times there's a little yellow bar right across the top that will say, you don't have these libraries, do you want to install them? And that's the most convenient way to install them. But if, if you don't see that, you can always click on packages and you can click on install. And for example, you can type Gapminder and uh, go ahead and install that. I'm going to click cancel because mine is already installed. I'm going to switch back to the full view. And when I run, when I execute this code chunk, that's going to just load these three libraries. Remember that in R, you only have to install a package once, but you have to load a library for every script that you're running. And I get some feedback from this execution of these three lines. The main part here is that this is telling me that when I load the tidyverse, I'm really loading eight libraries, one of which is ggplot2, another which is Deplier. Those are sort of the two main ones that most people use and are aware of. There's also Reader, which is for ingesting files, and uh, Forecats, which is for making your categorical, making your character vector data categorical, or for that matter, can make your numeric data categorical. Um, and it's actually pretty handy in ggplot. Um, and that's probably all we really need to cover there. But when you load Tidyverse, you automatically get uh, some onboard data sets. Uh, oh, this is wrong. I just realized um, one of those onboard data sets is, um, is called Star Wars. And that is just data about Star Wars characters over... I'm not sure if it's over all nine of the original, well, I don't even know how many Star Wars movies there are anymore, but it's, I don't think it's totally up to date, uh, but it, it just gives you some information to play with that you might be familiar with. A lot of people are familiar with Star Wars. So an easy thing to do is to use the glimpse command just to get a sense of this data structure, right? So this tells me I've got 87 rows, 14 columns, these are the names of the columns right here. 
with uh, a preview of the data for each column. And the other thing that you'll see here is it'll give you a little bit of information about the data type. So I have character data, integer data, floating point double numeric data. And I have some lists down here, which for purposes of yesterday and today, we're largely going to ignore. This whole thing, Star Wars is actually a data frame, right? So if I just type Star Wars by itself, um, I can see a grid of rectangular data and it's a preview, just a different way of looking at the data. So what I wanna do is I want to plot height and mass of my Star Wars characters into a scatter plot, which is a great plot to start with scatter plots because uh, particularly if you have numeric data, because it gives you an idea of how the data is gonna look in a two dimensional representation. And then you can try and uh, alter, alter that ggplot code to create different kinds of plots. But let's first just review the basic structure of a ggplot um, syntax. So you will see a lot of times that, uh, actually, if I map this, if I write this out a little bit more, I think this is mapping equals, uh, I should, pretty certain that's the way that goes. Um, the basic structure of the syntax is in ggplot, you give it a data frame, sometimes referred to as a tibble, and then you map aesthetics. So we're gonna map the X and map the Y coordinates. So in this case, we're gonna map um, height to X and map Y to be the response variable. Um, so mass is gonna to go to Y and height is the explanatory variable that goes to X. And then you have a conjunction. Yesterday, you remember we were covering, we're covering these pipes and the pipe conjunction is the standard conjunction in the tidyverse, except for when you're working with ggplot, where it uses the plus as a conjunction. Now, this has to do with the, the legacy and the evolution of the tidyverse. ggplot2 was the first tidyverse package. Back then, they used the plus as a conjunction. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous, particularly in a statistical setting, because a plus can mean addition. Whereas this, this is, well, maybe not so uh, convenient to type, uh, it's unambiguous because there's no other common uh, co co um, compound of characters like that. So everybody, when they look at it, they know it's, they know it's a pipe or a conjunction, but this is also a conjunction and it only works in ggplot. So, and you can't use them interchangeably, but you'll get an error message that'll help you figure out that you need to use one or the other. Um, in any case, that's my conjunction. So this first part here is just setting up the base of the plot. What is my data frame? What are my X and Y variables that I'm mapping as, a, as what are called mapping the aesthetics? And then um, you can also map, you can also set aesthetics, which is a form of mapping but it's not to a vector, right? The aesthetic mapping is to vectors or variables in your data frame. And then with the conjunction, you then choose multiple layers after that. So they're all called geom. So I might have geom one function there, geom, uh, I might have smooth here, and I might have geom line here. Um, we'll talk about how, how you figure that out, but you can then generate a multi-layered graphic or visualization based on that kind of grammar. So that's what it looks like in formally, the formal construction, but in practice, people don't really write it out that way. They, what they do generally, particularly in the tidyverse context is you name the data frame first, and then you use your data frame conjunction, the pipe, and you send that to ggplot. You'll notice here that in line 46, I'm using more to plier variables or uh, to play our functions to further manipulate or wrangle the data frame that I have, right? So I have this Star Wars data frame. If I highlight that and click control enter, it's an 87 row, uh, 14 variable data frame. If I run just lines 45 and 46 together, I'm getting rid of any characters, I'm subsetting, 
by, by only looking at the characters that have a mass of 500 kilograms or less, that's going to eliminate, uh, let's see, looks like, uh, well, it eliminated a whole bunch. I went from 87 to 58. Um, I think that that also eliminated all the NAs. Could be wrong about that. Um, let's just see. I could also do drop NA mass right here. And I'm just curious what happens when I do that. Yeah, that's 59. So the only thing that's happening in, and so, so the way filter is working in this case is it's, it's filtering out the NAs as well as the one character that weighs over 500 kilograms or has a mass of over 500 kilograms, All right? So that gives me a much smaller data frame. And I wouldn't need to do this, but I will tell you, I can use more deplier variables. Sometimes I do this when I'm, when I'm developing a plot um, and I just eliminate down to the critical parts that I really want to plot which in this case is height and mass, right? So I could just limit it down to that two dimensional um, data frame of two variables. And that might help me think through, um, maybe I might have, I might add gender if I wanted to add that for a color or something, but that might help me think through my plot. In any case, line 48 is not absolutely necessary, but it's just a way of noting that you can use all of those data wrangling tools that you learned yesterday to set yourself up to then make a plot. And so in practice, people send a data frame, they pipe it then to ggplot. Um, I did use control enter to, when, I, when I was selecting lines, if I wanted to just run those copy, those highlighted lines, I would use control enter. Um, yes, that's a great question. Um, and you say yours doesn't work. Hmm. I don't think I can troubleshoot that right now. Um, you might try restarting your R Studio. You might just verify that you are, um, if you're on a Mac, you might try Command Enter. Um, and when we get to a stopping point, maybe we can, we can deal with that. Um, you could also just for convenience, right? You could just, put three back ticks right there and, and make the size of your coding chunk smaller for temporarily. Um, the back ticks are, on my keyboard, the back ticks are above the tab button and to the left of the number one, but they're probably in different places on different keyboards, back ticks. Um, right, so, so I'm piping this to, um, to ggplot, and then I'm doing, again, I'm not writing out the full construction. I'm not writing data equals because that got piped in, and I'm not writing mapping equals aesthetics because it's just assumed, and you'll notice I'm not writing x equals and I'm not writing y equals, but you could if it helps you think through what's happening here. I just want you to be aware of, this is sort of how conventionally people start writing it. So if we just run that much of the code, all I've done so far is I have sent a data frame with a height and mass mapped variables to ggplot. And what ggplot did for me is it then started to construct the canvas upon which I'm gonna make my visualization, right? So it gave me an X label, which is from that mapping. It gave me a Y label, which is from that mapping. Um, I can alter those, but it gave me those. It also looked at the scope of those two vectors and it decided what the um, tick marks and breaks and break labels would be uh, for this graph. But I still, of course, don't have anything that I've plotted. That's okay. Um, but no one would, of course, no one would stop here, right? I just need one more layer. So I use that next conjunction, the ggplot conjunction, and I say, let's use a scatter plot, um, which is called geom point. It's one of the many geom functions that we have available to us. And you'll notice um, that it then plotted all of those points. And um, just for the sake of argument, let's comment out line 47 and you'll see why I filtered my subset of my data frame um, because that right there is Jabba the Hutt 
who is a rather massive character. And um, it makes it look like my data doesn't have any pattern to it, which I didn't want it to be that way. And I don't really feel bad about dumping Job of the Hut out of my data set because these are all fictional characters. So maybe in real life, that's not the best thing to do. Maybe it is, depends on the data story you wanna do, depends on how you wanna handle outliers. But um, that's a real world example of how you can generate a plot like that. So before we get into more about plotting, which we will do in just a minute, we'll do more, we'll talk about how you identify these other uh, geometric functions and how you manipulate them. And we'll talk about how you can add alter labels, add titles, um, use color, things of that nature. Um, I want to just quickly cover a very simple tool for exploratory data analysis. Yesterday, we, we used, we leveraged functions in Deplier like group by and summarize, which we could use to get column totals. And I don't think I covered it too deeply, but you could also get, you know, means and minimums and maximums and things like that. We may, we may want to revisit that. But another way to get sort of this, the general scope of your data is to use this function called skim, which comes from the skimmer library. And if I just skim on Gapminder, or for that matter, I might um, skim on Star Wars, since we're talking about Star Wars. Um, Star Wars. Let's just do Star Wars first. Um, if I just hit Control Enter on Star Wars line 57, um, it'll tell me some stuff that I can figure out in other ways, but it's nice and conveniently presented here, right? 87 rows, 14 columns, eight of the columns are character columns, three of them are numeric, three of them are lists. And then using those data types, it tells me a little bit more about the, the vectors that have those that share those common data types, like the character um, vectors have these names, what they're missing, what the minimum and maximum values are, how many, what the unique values are, whether or not there's any white space, et cetera. Um, numerically, you can get, oh, these are the lists, and that stuff is not super helpful to me right now, but you can tell me how many, what's the length of the lists. The thing I like about the numeric representation in skim is that it gives me this, aside from giving me the standard deviation and the mean and the breakpoints for the quantiles, um, it also gives me this nice little spark graph, which is a graph that I could generate in ggplot, right? It could be a histogram. Um, so just, uh, just, to, just to leverage this a little bit, what if supposing I didn't actually want to um, make a, a, a scatter plot, but I just wanted to get a histogram of the value of height, I should be able to, so let's just comment this out just to make it clear. I should be able to, oh, it didn't like the fact that I had um, mass in there. Oh, what did I do wrong? Um, height not found. Why is height not found? Error in data, data mapping, blah, 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 geom bar, object height not found. Oh, I know why. Because I don't have aesthetics. And I have to put in aesthetics. So, uh, you know, there's a histogram. I can do it that way. It can alter the size of the bins, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, if you have a lot of data and you don't want to generate all of that code just for, just to fit, figure out simple distributions of multiple variables, you can get that with Skimmer, right? So I can see that the height distribution is sort of normal. Um, and I can see that the birth rate and birth year and mass are essentially right skewed um, data representations. So uh, what I would like to do next is dig more into um, ggplot by going to I'm going to go to O2A viz answers. And I like to use answers because it means I can type less. Um, but I also want to give people a chance, especially people who did any advanced work and they 
and there, you know, that you know what questions you have about the material shared. So I'm going to stop talking for just a little bit and give people a chance to unmic and ask questions. And uh, and I see that Chital is asking a question in the chat. You could ask it that way as well. Let me see what it says. Are the x axes the same for all histograms generated using skim? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, it the x axis is going to be whatever numerical variables you have in your data frames. So if I that was one I did for Star Wars, but let's go ahead and do it for Gapminder, which I think is mostly um, numeric data. Yeah. So you can see here, like I've got a U-shaped curve for year and I've got a slightly left skewed uh, curve shape for life expectancy versus right skewed for um, POP and GD cap. So I believe the answer to that is yes. I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So if I haven't answered it, please feel free to, to redirect me. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll also invite, um, I sorry, I mean, is the range of the X axis the same? So I guess you're asking, can you, can you alter the bin width of this? Because the range is always going to be the full range of the data frame. And as far as I know, and if I'm, or is it specific to the variable? It is specific to the variable. Um, so this little histogram is only specific to year. Um, and then it, and then it will change. And then so if you want to generate a different, more sophisticated histogram, you would definitely move into, for example, ggplot or something like that. And we'll we'll get there. Um, hopefully, I don't think I have a histogram example per se because they're not too hard to generate. But um, if you, as we go on, if you want to direct it, um, that'd be great. Uh, so other questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat or unmic. And meanwhile, I'm going to go to, I'm going to get set up to go to this other code, which is O2 visualization, O2 underscore A underscore viz underscore answers. We're going to use three ggplot onboard data frames for this part of the text or this part of the explanation. MPG is about cars and the miles per gallon of cars. Midwest is some population data about um, some states in the Midwest and economics long is some economic data. If I shift back to my four quadrant view, let me just note that for example, with MPG, if I highlight that and on my keyboard, I hit F1 um, in the help tab, I can read some information about the MPG, the ggplot, to MPG data frame. So in this case, it, it operates a little bit like a code book. That won't work for every data that you ingest. It, it works for this package because the package has that documentation added into it. Um, but you can see, for example, you know, the, if there's a, there's a variable called CYL, which is the number of cylinders of the car, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that I want to introduce to you, which I haven't done before, is that we may go to a, a document. There's additional documentation at ggplot2.tidyverse.org. Let me put that in the chat so you don't have to type it in. Um, and it's the same documentation as what you get on board. It includes a link to a spreadsheet. Uh, what I like to use it for, however, is um, Aside from the fact that it will really explain things, and there's some really nice articles here about how to use ggplot2 in different ways, um, I usually use it for the reference link. And the reference link is broken down into all of these different elements of the grammar of graphics grammar, uh, including the layers, all of those geometric functions, right? So if I want to make a 2D uh, xbin graph, that would be geombin 2D. Here's information about bar charts. So geom underscore bar and geom underscore call. Uh, a line chart's got to be in there somewhere, generally alphabetical, but um, I don't see it. So I'm just going to free text search for it, geom line. There it is right there, right next to geom path. 
Um, you know, all of these different layers are layers that you can generate and they will have a lot of similar uh, features, but each of them will have some unique features. Uh, so for example, if I find geom, well, let's find geom histogram underscore hist, though it's right there. Um, it will give me the arguments for how I can operate the different layers that are similar. So in this case, there's geom freak poly, geom histogram, geom bin, um, and stat bin. I'm sorry, stat underscore bin. Um, but this is the one I'm interested in. You can see the arguments that, that we've sort of already talked about, like mapping and data. And um, the AES is common to all of them. But then there's a couple other extra things. But let's scroll down here. Here's more information about the arguments. And the other thing that's really useful here is uh, the aesthetics. Oh, it's not as clear in this one. I'm going to back back out of this one because it's not as clear. Let's go to geom point, which is right here, and scroll down to where it says aesthetics. And these aesthetics, what goes inside of the AES argument, a lot of these are common to almost all of the functions, like mapping the eps, mapping, mapping the y, changing the color, um, either the internal color or the outline color, color and fill, uh, or changing the opacity, how transparent it is, or changing the shape and size. But if you need to know what aesthetic arguments are available for which function, you definitely need to go into the documentation, either online or on board in our studio. And again, just to recap, all of those layers are listed there in the documentation. So what have we done so far? We have uh, introduced MPG, which looks like this. Let me make it bigger. Um, and what I want to do is I want to, I've got some, some setup here, make a scatter plot using displacement. That is, let me scroll to the right. Where is my displacement? Sorry, I didn't need to scroll because it's right there. Displacement, which is the size of the cylinder. In other words, how much fuel does it consume when the cylinder is fired with fuel? Um, so we're gonna we're gonna make a scatter plot with displacement as the x variable and highway mileage as the response variable or the y variable. And that is highway mileage. Where is it? Right here, highway right there. So the setup for that, pretty straightforward. MPG and then ggplot for inside of aesthetics, x equals display, y equals highway. And that will give me a basic canvas. And then since I want a scatter plot, I'm just going to switch my conjunction and write g on point, g on underscore point. And I get a very clear pattern there. A uh, little something here starts to go wonky, but otherwise a pretty clear pattern. And um, now let's add some color. So the question is, you, um, by class of vehicle, let's take a look back at the data frame and find class. The class vector is right here. We can see that we have compact cars, uh, mid-sized cars, SUVs, two-seaters, things of that nature. So all I've got to do is take this add more aesthetic arguments, in this case, into the geom point. I think I have one too many closed parentheses there. And so now you'll see that I've got aesthetic arguments mapping X and Y up here in the general ggplot argument. So that means that X and Y of displacement and highway are available to all of my layers. And then specific to the geom point layer, I'm mapping the color variable to class. And that's gonna allow the plot to get drawn. It's going to, ggplot is gonna draw for me a legend that associates, gonna pick the colors for me, which I can change if I want to, um, but it will show me kind of a nicer view where I can get a better sense of how these uh, different classes of vehicles fit into my scatter plot. Right, and then I can start to see over here where this pattern doesn't hold so well, like what is going on here? Well, it turns out it's all one class of car. 
and it turns out they're two-seater cars, so that means sports cars, then I can start to understand, you know, there are cars that, that consume a lot of fuel in their displacement that still get higher gas mileage. And a, a reasonable explanation for that is that a two-seater car is probably a sports car that's probably pretty light, right? Much lighter than, for example, these SUVs that might be consuming the same amount of fuel and displacement or slightly less, but getting considerably less gas mileage. Anyway, that starts to become clearer. And I did that with color. Note that I could um, change this argument to fill and it's gonna do something slightly, oops, I didn't mean to do all that. Um, give me a second here. Ah, it didn't work because I forgot I needed a different shape. This isn't documented so well, but it, um, I'm gonna change the shape equals 21, I think. Um, no, no reason why you would specifically know that. Um, all right, I'm, I'm messing something up here by trying to get too advanced and going off script. There we go. Uh, you'll notice here that fill, if, you have, if I have the right kind of shape, and that'll all be in the documentation, fill is just the interior color, whereas color then could be something different, uh, like let's call it um, yellow. And that helps me bring out one other aspect that's important. Oh, that doesn't show up very well. Let's call it green. That doesn't show up too well either. Um, but, uh, and more commonly I would use black actually. Uh, but one, one of the things that you can tease out of this part of the discussion is that by aesthetically mapping things, I'm mapping to vectors, but I can also set these arguments specifically to something, right? So that it has nothing to do with the variability of the data. It's just, I specifically want something to happen with the graph and you can do both of those together. Um, now, the last part of this question, add a regression line for each type of car. So there's a function called geom smooth, which has the ability to, um, well, let me, let me not uncomment that. Let's go ahead and run this whole thing as it is. And you'll see that by default, geom smooth is gonna write, it's gonna write in a regression line, it's going to add in a gray bar for the confidence interval. And in this case, it's doing its best guess as to what kind of smoothing of the line you want. And so I know from experience, although I think I can look in, in the console message, it says it's using the low S method. And it's reminding me that the formula for that regression, and we're going to talk more about regression in a minute, but the, um, towards the end of today, but the formula is Y predicted from X, right? Now, it got y and x from here, right? This is x equals and y equals. So that's how that's happening. If I, for whatever reason, wanted to alter that so that it was just uh, a straight up linear regression, I could try method equals LM. And I could also turn off the confidence interval um, SE equals false. And um, there I have a, a linear regression line specific to, to all of the data, right? But you'll notice in line 39 that I can also write regression lines that are specific to each class of data. Um, so it's just interesting to know that you can do these things. Right now I have a low S line for each type. It doesn't, I don't particularly like that all that well. I think I might actually make that method equals LM, but it, it depends on what story you wanna tell. Um, and you get a better sense of how you can start to manipulate the grammar in your multiple layers. So in this case, it's a two layer graph, right? A scatter plot and on top of the scatter plot, a regression line. Okay, 
Well, now that we know that, now that we know how to make a scatter plot, we can use that information to make a bar plot. So let's look at our Midwest data real quickly. It is, among other things, uh, population total, population density, um, and population by various ge uh, demographic groups. And if we go all the way over, there's a category here. I'm not sure what these categories are, but it's a categorical setting, even if it's not a categorical data type, okay? Um, there are reasons to manipulate data into factor data type, um, but you don't always need to. Sometimes you can leverage the, fact, the, the categorical data even without making it a factor data type. And not everybody uses that factorial information, so I'm not gonna dig into it right now. But if I take Midwest and I just plot category, that's this far variable by making, making that essentially the X axis of GM bar, notice while there are 437 um, rows to this data, what GM bar is gonna do is it's gonna count up and give me a total for each one of these distinct categories, right? So in that way, not undifferent from what we learned yesterday, count category, it's going to give me a bar uh, height for each one of the each one of the total values of the distinct categories. But if I comment that out and run that plot, I have a bar plot that shows me, you know, that there the largest category or the most frequent category is AAR, and then there are several like HHR and HHU and AHU that are probably the least frequent. Uh, from a visualization perspective, generally speaking, I would um, not stop here because I would prefer to sort my bars. And this is where uh, a different tidyverse function comes in really handy. And that is the tidyverse function that enables me to explicitly make the character vector um, variable called category. Right, let's just review that. Um, this vector is a character vector, but if I wanted to, to explicitly make it a, fact, uh, a factor data type, I could use one of, one of the functions from four cats, which is a tidyverse function. And specifically the one I wanna use is factor in frequency, which will, um, total the observations in order from largest to smallest. So I'm just going to manipulate that variable as a factor. And I need to turn this off. And then I have a sorted bar chart, um, which, is, which is useful because they're, they're not, it's not always useful to sort a bar chart alphabetically, although that may be the default that we saw before it's really more useful to sort of look at it this way so I can get a good, a good sense of, of all of these values um, in order. I will note, however, that there's this really nice feature of ggplot, which is particularly useful for bar charts that have longer labels, most, most of which have longer labels, that you can alter the axis by saying uh, lip, is it flip or is it coordinate flip? Flip, it's coordinate flip. Coordinate flip. Notice what happens here is now I have, I have changed my X and Y axis. Uh, you know, I have this slight inconvenience that now my, my order of my bars is not quite how I wanted it to be. Uh, so I could actually add one more function factor reverse and um, display my bars in a way that's, that's more commonplace to best practices of visualization. All right, uh, now there is a geom bar function right here. There's also a geom call function because while sometimes you have data Let's see what we're doing here. Um, let's just look at the Midwest data. 
right? I have a I have like what we did there is we calculated we had ggplot count each one of these AARs and count each one of the LARs and the LHRs, but sometimes you have totals, right? So for example, if we ran um, some deplier functions to get population totals by state, Geom bar is not gonna work in this case because it's, it doesn't know what to do with this information, right? Geom bar only takes one argument, which is mapping the X axis. This is the same as saying X equals, and it does the calculating by itself. Whereas Geom call needs an X and a Y axis. So in this case, the X axis is state and the Y axis is state pop. And then Geom call will work just fine. And we will get a bar chart um, of those values. And I would probably be inclined to um, order this <clears throat> factor reorder state by state underscore pop. And unfortunately, that's not in the order I want. But of course, remember, I could factor reverse which I did something wrong, spelled something wrong, still spelled it wrong, can't spell. There we go. And there are some things I don't like about this chart, like it doesn't have a title, it doesn't have a very pretty um, markings here. Uh, and I don't like, I don't particularly like the X and Y labels, all of which I can change. Uh, let's see what happens here when we run. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and do it up here. Um, so first thing I want to do is I want to um, I want to add some labels. So I'm going to use the lab function. I'm going to say title equals state population. I could add a subtitle if I wanted to. Oops, that doesn't, subtitle equals um, request. I can change my X axis to state. Currently it's an auto-generated label and I probably don't need a Y axis, but if I don't need, if I don't want it at all, I could just make it Y equals nothing or I could put in the word population. I could also put in um, a little caption about my data source, source colon gg plot plot to colon colon Midwest. Let's see how far we get with that. So there I've, I've improved some of the labeling. Still not crazy about this. Uh, a couple different ways I can handle that. I could go in here and add some change to the scale. So scale, in this case, it's the Y axis and it's a continuous variable, right? So I could do that. And then all of this is in the documentation, but I just want to introduce it to you. Um, I could do this thing where I say labels equals and then run a new function, scales, colon, colon, comma. That will make it pretty. Um, or, you know, that's pretty, but it's those zeros are a little superfluous. I could do something completely different. I could, um, let's, uh, let's comment that out and do it a different way where I set the breaks equal to, and I'll, I'll set a range. Let's say I want 5 million and I want 10 million. And uh, that gives me just two breaks, still in scientific notation, which may be what I want, or maybe I want to make it really pretty. So then I'm going to say for, for the number of breaks I have, I might say uh, 5M and 
um, and you know, in that way, I can start to alter not only the um, with scale arguments. Am I altering the labels? But I, you remember up here, way up there, I was introducing color. I can also use the scale argument to um, alter the, the colors that are chosen. Um, in this, where is it? Hold on, let me, let me grab this. Copy. In this little guide that I worked up, a lot of that stuff, and let me paste that into the chat. A lot of that stuff is um, about scales and color is covered in here, about how you can use different kinds of functions and things like that. This is sort of a, a quick sheet, quick uh, reference guide. But if I go to scales, you'll see that I'm using different colors. R will choose colors for you if you don't choose any. And then you can use scale to alter your colors to different pre-chosen categorical or continuous color ramps, depending on what, or you can even set them manually, depending on what you want to do. Um, that can be a little tricky to work with at first. I don't, I'm not necessarily going to cover that right now. I'm happy to if you want to, but uh, I'm going to let the group um, sort of direct that if that's of, of that, if that's of interest today. Another thing to mention, right? So we've now done some scatter plots, some histograms, some box plots, all with the same grammar. Let's add a, a line plot because one of the things that uh, ggplot will do very nicely for you is it will make a time series graph. So if we look at economics long, actually, before we do that, let's look at economics. So I can sh um, mention to you the difference between long and wide data. So this is wide data, which is not particularly tidy as we were talking about yesterday, right? There's this observation has, a, has an observation for PCE, an observation for POP, an observation for PSAVERT, unemployment, whatever. There's 574 rows, but tidy data would be long. There would be some redundancy in the data, but the PCE operations are gonna be there. And if I scroll through, Let's see how far I'm going to have to scroll through to get a different observation. Um, I have pop, things of that nature. So my point being that um, when you transform your data to long with ggplot, it's a lot of times it's more easier. To, it's easier to iterate over that data to generate the graph that you want. So we're going to talk next about pivoting, but we'll start out with economics long, and we're going to set our x var variable to date, which you'll notice is a specific data type called a date. And if it is a date, then ggplot will do smart things with that date um, in terms of how it displays them and how it chooses labels. Um, so x equals date, which is common in a time series graph, and y in this case is going to equal value, or it could be value one. Value one is just scaled between zero and one for the values in the value column. Um, and then I'm gonna set geom line and identify a color by the variable. That is the different distinct categories that show up in the variable column called variable, right? And I get this graph, which is, we looked at this a little bit yesterday based on a question. It's um, this one variable here called pop is, very much out of scale with the other numbers. So it's hard to tell what's going on here. But if I change this to value of one, which was the, which was the scaled value, um, you can get a better sense of how all of those variables work over time. Everything scaled between zero and one. But notice on the x-axis, ggplot chose to display the label the x-axis by decade even though if you look at the data, um, it's not displayed that way in the data frame, right? It's actually year, month, day. But ggplot has done some calculations and said, well, you don't really need to know all that stuff based on this data frame. And that's something that's particularly challenging to work with in um, data in general is date type data and time data. 
There's a nice library to help you work with that called Lubridate. Um, let me just let me just uh, write that out so you can see it. Library Lubridate, um, and that will help you manipulate date information. But we don't actually need it for what we're doing today. Uh, another thing to point out is. Well, that number is scaled. That number doesn't tell you much about the actual values of these different variables. So a different way to do that, we talked about that before, is to use the facet wrap. So we're going back to value instead of value 01, which value 01 is the scaled one. And we can display all this together. And um, you know, some things get muted because they're out of scale. And then we could add a function called facet wrap and create a faceted graph by the one, two, three, four variables listed there. And um, they're still a little muted, but you can see them a little bit differently. You can also have these nice features where you um, change the scales, free them up. So I can type free underscore y. All of this is in the documentation. And now I get a different Y scale for each one of these facets, but notice that it is still using a common X scale where it can, right? I could also uh, N row, I think, N row equals one. Um, in that case, uh, it's, it's repeating the X axis all the time. I could do N call equals one which wouldn't make a very nice graph, but you can see that it has that common Y scale. The other thing I could do, ignoring all that, um, well, let's just do N row equals one, and I'll show you another feature. Um, this feels a little squished. It looks a little squished. Also, this legend is not necessary because I can see that this is the unemployment um, and the PSAVER and the PCE. So I might turn that legend off right here. Show legend equals false. And I might try and make it even wider by clicking on this little gear over here, which will set some, some settings for this code chunk. And I'll toggle this thing that says use custom width and I'll change the width to, let's change the width to 12 and click apply. And what happens is it wrote this in up here. Now, if I write, run this one more time, um, I've got a much, it's actually a little, it feels like, feels like it's a little too, too long. Let's make it nine by six, see what happens there. That's a little better, still big, How about nine by three. There we go. Um, you have all of those, features to, to manipulate your, your graphic. And, and then in the end, if you want to save it, you could use this function called ggsave and give it a name. Let me give it a name. We're going to call it example.png. And I'm going to zoom back out to the files menu, and you'll see that it'll show up right there in the root of, uh, my, of my RStudio project. And it's right there. And then I could look at it, uh, manipulate it, copy it, paste it, do whatever I want with it. OK. So what I want to do now, I'm going to send you a little survey. Oops. I didn't mean to do that, um, but it's OK. I'll get that straight. And um, the survey will help us figure out what we're going to do next. And it's going to ask you, do you want to do you want to talk about interactive visualizations? Just pick two from this survey, or do join and merge, or do pivot, or do regression. We'll try and cover them all. Um, 
And there should also be questions. And some and somebody asked, can we save export the figures into MS Word and can those be editable? So uh, that's an interesting question uh, because let me click share again and go back to that screen where I was, uh, which is where we're here. So this is just, I mean, this is just a, it's a PNG file because that's what I called it. But, um, you know, I could, I could make it a JPG file, whatever. I could also change the height and width here, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, and you can move that into Word as you see fit or uh, picking up from yesterday, um, I could just knit as a Word file and it would exist in the Word file. Um, there we go. Let's see, did I do that right? Line 60. That's interesting. Let's try this again, knit, knit to Word. Um, and the file, in this case, the file that it's gonna generate on the fly is, is still gonna require some more formatting, but, um, oh, and the execution is still halted. I wonder why, what did I do wrong? Error function that produced HTML output found in document targeting. Oh, that's interesting. I'm doing something to, I'm doing some, too, too much of something here. I'm not sure what, and I don't really want to troubleshoot it right now, but you can generate the Word file from here. Um, and you can also open these files in additional editing tools and do more things with them. So for example, I did that a minute ago. I just clicked on it and it threw me into a Microsoft Word editor, uh, which allows me to, you know, I can do more. I don't know how this tool works because I, I um, have never used it, but yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can do more stuff and save it and do whatever I want to with it. Um, Charlie asks, what is the command to change background color? So it's a good question, Charlie. Um, let's run this one again. Uh, so there are themes that you can use. So for example, I can say theme underscore uh, classic, and it will change that to white. I could do theme, um, theme. There's a whole bunch of themes and you can see them there. Uh, gray, light, dark, line draw. Um, you can also do void. And then you can really get into the, um, you can set arguments inside of themes and generate whatever color you want, um, depending on what you're doing. All right, let's have a look at the, at the results of the survey. And I see I got another question here. If you haven't filled out the survey, please do. It says in Stata, there's a feature that allows to save quote, already configured graphs as graph underscore name dot G P H to then be able to edit them again. Um, is it, as useful as you can edit graphs directly without having to recode it all. Oh, right. Yeah, so you can do the same thing here. So let's take a look at this. Um, let's assign this to call it my plot. Notice that if I just run line 60 through 64, I don't get any output because all I've done is I have assigned that graph, come on computer. Why can't I get my, I don't understand why, oh. All I've done is I've assigned that graph to an object called my plot. If I then call my plot, I get that graph, right? And then if I want to, I can uh, do more with that, more in ggplot with that graph, like uh, probably give it theme dark and it changes it again, uh, I could probably add it, but yeah, you can do more to it, right? So you can, you're, you don't actually so much save it as you assign it as an object that you can continue to ma manipulate. 
All right. Um, and scroll down to the bottom. All I have to do is load this library called Plotly. And just like I did a moment ago, where I generated a ggplot object, let's, let's just run these lines. Um, that generates for me a bar plot. It's a stack bar plot. It's colored by, uh, filled in color by the state. And it is a bar plot of categories, whatever these categories are. And if I wanted to uh, make that bar plot interactive, and the easiest way to do it is to use that plotly function called ggplotly. Now there are other ways to make interact. There's a whole range of these things called HTML widgets. And, and if you Google the phrase HTML widgets, you'll run across this gallery. You can do just a number of things, but we have time to, to sort of cover this quickly. Once I run that, I get it. I'm in a whole different feature where I have some interactivity that I can, I can zoom in on things. Um, I can get fly out windows and it's still drawing the legend. I can turn on and off this um, toolbar. I can make a picture and download that as a PNG. Really nice feature. You can then integrate that into HTML reports or dashboards or web stuff. And of course, another layer of interactivity would be to make these visualizations using a, an R tool called Shiny, which um, is more advanced than we're going to have time to do. And um, somewhere on the R Fund site, there's a shiny, there's an introduction to shiny that you that I would encourage you to look at if you're interested. Okay. Um, joins and merges. Let's do that next. Files, joins and merges, pivots and joins. Okay, so for this one, we're going to. Uh, we're in O2B pivot join answers. We're going to still use the tidyverse packages and we're going to read in some data, some onboard data that is in this data folder right here called 538 Fibility Ratings. And um, we're skipping 11 lines that has the provenance of where that data came from. It came from the 538. Uh, Com data journalism's GitHub site, and I manipulated it some, but basically they did a survey where they asked people who their favorite Star Wars characters are. And, um, and so you can see that you've got, for example, Han Solo, who has a rating of 610. So he's, in this case, a very favorite character. And then maybe look down at, um, Lando Calrissian, Boba Fett, they're not so loved. Uh, 110, Emperor Palpatine, like he's a big villain, right? People don't, people don't like them. Um, and, and historically people have not liked this character, Jar Jar Binks. So you get a sense of what that's like. And what we wanna do is we want to, um, we wanna join that data with a different data frame, right? So we have already, Star Wars data. And if we look at these two together, one of them is a 14 row, two column data frame. And one of them is an 87 row, 14 column data frame. And what we want is we want to add those two data frames together. And you, what you need is you need some kind of join key, some common variable across both data tables. So um, just so you know, I could add these data tables together with something like um, bind rows, I think, uh, fave ratings and Star Wars. And the problem is that um, they don't have common variables. So I just end up with um, really just a bunch of garbage um, in a way. Like this fave rating only goes on for 14 variables. And, <clears throat> and there's no, um, and some characters are repeated. So you can do that if your data is already well-formed and, and good to add together. But what I wanna do is I wanna make a join that makes a little bit more sense. Um, there are several different kinds of joins I can do. 
And in the tidyverse, it's called the one join that most people do is called a left join. And uh, that would look like this. I could describe these joins to you, but it quickly turns into word salad. Um, it's a little bit easier with the Venn diagrams, right? So if I have a left data table and a right data table, anywhere where there's a commonality, that join key that I was just mentioning, it'll bring over the data from the right data table, right? So you can do the opposite of that and you can find the, only the intersection. And then you can find, for example, we'll use an anti-join where we wanna find out what exists in table X that doesn't exist in table Y and vice versa. Um, so we're gonna use the join key name. And let me just say in advance that this is from a data, from a data manipulation perspective, this is a bad plan. Um, ideally, when you do joins, you wanna do joins on unique, non-ambiguous constructions which sort of explains why we all have um, a driver's license ID number and for example, a Duke University employee ID or student ID number is we have something that's unique to us that it's easy for a computer to go, oh, this is, this is just very clear. Your numbers, I like to say, for example, in, in, let's say in the Star Wars universe, Luke Skywalker's employee ID is 001 and Emperor Palpatine's employee ID is 666. It's easy for the computer to figure out those things and match them up where they're where they're appropriate. But we don't have an employee ID. And um, so character data is gonna be more fuzzy and name data even more fuzzy because of the alternate ways that you can spell things. Um, you may not know how to spell them. You may capitalize things or not capitalize things. In any case, it will illustrate a good example. We're gonna use name the name variable as our join key because it's common across both tables. All right, so the way you would write that specifically is, is we would take the first table, that's gonna be our left join, and left join it to our right table. And I, you'll see that I have line 44 commented out. The long construction of this is to say by, and then say where the, what are the join keys? In this case, they're both called name. So I don't really have to write that out, but I might have, name in one table and last name last name in another table. And so it gives me that flexibility, but I can write it without doing that. Um, I can do a left join of favorability rating to Star Wars. And when I do that, um, it now gives me, it adds one column. It used to be a 14 row, I'm sorry, it adds many columns. It was a 14 by two, data frame, fave rating, and then it added 14 more columns or 13 because name is, is common to the two. So now it's 14, 14 rows by 15 columns. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot of NAs. Um, those NAs came over, I think from the original, no, they didn't, um, sorry. Those NAs are where there was no match, right? There was no match from the, favoriting Princess Leia Organa to Star Wars. Now, you'll instantly notice this doesn't really make a lot of sense because she's a main character and the other table is bigger, but that's because the key join was ambiguous and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, let's go ahead and arrange that, sort it so that you can see what we've got here. We're sorting by favoriting. And again, Han Solo shows up as the most liked character. I'm going to use then anti-join in this case, just to kind of figure out what's not matching. So in my first case, I'm saying, show me what exists in fave ratings that doesn't exist in Star Wars. And then in my second anti-join, show me what exists in Star Wars that doesn't just exist in fave rating. And it's interesting because there are 79 characters that don't match here, and a lot of which are not in the first table, like BB-8. I don't even know what BB-8 is. I'm not familiar with a lot of these characters. Uh, I know the main ones. So if I go back here to the first one, it just makes no sense to me that C, C3PO, Emperor Palpatine, there's Princess Leia. Why are those not matching? And so I'm gonna do a little bit of um, magic here. Not, it's not really magic, but advanced regular expressions to find pat text patterns in the other table. 
I'm not going to talk about regular expressions today, but they come in really handy. But let's just look at this. C dash 3P0 does not match C dash 3PO because computers are, are very literal, right? Zero and O are not the same thing as far as the computer's concerned. That's not a match. That goes to what I was talking about. Unambiguous, clear matching works best with IDs that are unambiguous. Um, Princess Leia Organa does not match, match Leia Organa. You can do things to manipulate your match key when it's characters, like you can make everything lowercase, take out the uh, diacritical remarks, take out the spaces. You're still going to end up with uh, not as clear a match as if you had a, a crisp, unambiguous ID to match on, but you can improve your chances. All right, um, pivoting. So we'll take economics here. This is some wide data. And let me just note that a lot of times in R, in the tidyverse in particular, it's advantageous to have long data. So for example, instead of 547 by six rows, we would have 2,870 by four rows. Advantageous because it's easier to iterate over those variables. Uh, but sometimes, depending on the function you're trying to uh, manipulate, it's easier, it's better to have the wide data. So you can pivot either direction with two functions, one called pivot longer, and the corresponding one is called uh, pivot wider. And for people who've been using R for a while, roughly corresponds to two functions called spread and gather. And there's some other functions that are not coming to me right now. Um, but economics long arranged by date, uh, it's the exact same data that just, it turns out to be some redundancy in the data, but it's not so big of a deal anymore. Back in the sixties and seventies, data storage was expensive. It's now, you know, you can get a, a phone that has more storage than the more disk storage or RAM storage than the computer that put, um, a rocket on the moon or a, or a lunar lander on the moon. So a lot of times you're better off to have more data, redundant data that has some sort of built-in semantic meaning. And R enables you to deal with that. Um, and the way pivot longer works, let's look at economics. If we wanted to get this view from this, and that's what it's already done, right? But let's just take a look at economics. And then the arguments to pivot longer are what columns do you want to pivot? In this case, I'm saying PC3 through un PCE through unemployed. So this and this and P saver all the way, you know, this through that. Those are the columns I want to pivot. And I want to change those column names into a column called variable. Names to these names become a column. And then the values are going to go into a column called values, value. So I end up with this, right? Here is, here are my column names, PCE, POP, PSAVERT, unemployed, and here are the values of those observations. And by extension, that makes it more, um, this is now tall data. It's a little bit easier to iterate over and make, among other things, make um, graphs with minimal amount of code. Okay. So, oh, we're going faster than I expected, but um, I guess I kind of stepped it up there. So um, let's go ahead and finish up and talk about regression because that's probably the more uh, complicated and um, go ahead and throw it, you know, on mic and ask a question if you want to. I will try and demystify things, but I'm going to open up 02C regression answers. And in this case, we're going to use a library called Broom, which is part of the tidyverse. I'm using the plier and ggplot. Uh, I could probably, for, con for concise code, I should probably write it like this um, because I don't need to write the plier and tidy and ggplot too when I'm because the tidyverse is going to load those anyway. Uh, Broom and modern dive actually sort of do the same thing. 
It's just that modern dive is really a, a package that leverages Broom to teach statistics. So I am not a statistician. It's helpful to me to, to have run through the free Broom book, which by the way is available online and free here. It's called moderndive.com. Uh, but I'm only gonna talk about the Broom functions. Uh, although I use both in this code set. We'll just load those three libraries. Here is the construction of making a linear regression, right? So I have my Star Wars data. If I look at that, notice that the argument is, is pretty different. I can't use my pipes here. So data equals Star Wars. And then in the way you write a linear regression argument is you say mass um, is predicted from height, right? So the response variable predicted from the explanatory variable. If I had a different additional variables, it's not, it's not appropriate for this data set, but I would use the plus construction, for example, um, birth underscore year. Um, if I could, if I can convert my, I can recode eye color into a numeric categorical variables. Um, I could say plus um, eye color. But um, that's not going to work in this case because it's a character variable. At least I don't think it will work. Um, so, and let's take that all, let's just keep it simple. I just want you to see that construction. That is the way you write a linear regression statement using the linear LM function. And I'm going to assign the output of that to a function, to a, a object name called my model. So my model. There's my coefficients. It reminds me what the formula is. And um, a lot of people will then use the summary function on my model and they'll get a bit more information, um, some evaluative statistics uh, markers about the model itself, like the R squared and the P value and the adjusted R squared. Note, however, that this it's great to be able to see that on the screen. It's hard to manipulate that. And that's where the broom function comes in, right? So I could type in um, broom. I could use the tidy function on my model. And the result of that will be a data frame. And so there, there are my coefficients, including my p-value information, or I could use um, uh, glance, and I'm going to get some additional evaluative information like the adjusted R squared. And, th and th this information will, will change depending on the type of statistical model you're doing, right? So there's LM, there's also GLM, and there's a there, the list goes on and on, depends on what you want to do. Um, but broom and glance for linear functions and for, for whatnot, the advantage is that it puts it into a data frame. So for example, if I just, it, now I can use my um, deplier functions to easily pull things out. Like I could say filter where term equals height. And I might um, select estimate. and p, p value, see if that works, yeah. So it's, it's just becomes, and you know, if, if for some reason I wanted to get it out of the data table again, I could do that. Um, it just becomes easier, once you understand that grammar of the plier, it becomes easier to manipulate the outputs of your model if you use Broom to tidy up those outputs. Um, there's also a thing called um, augment, which will give you the residuals of your output um, and the predicted um, the dot hat fitted, that kind of thing. Let's look at how that plays out, right? So in the broom, I'm sorry, in the um, modern dive library, there's a data set called evals. And we're going to just pull out a couple variables from evals and um, look at this smaller data frame of 463 observations where there's an ID variable of the observations. Everybody gets a score, 
They all have their age recorded and there's a subjective variable called beauty average. And I don't exactly know the origin of this data, but um, it's essentially um, our, our hypothesis is gonna be that age and beauty average affect the score of these instructors. This comes from some evaluation of college instructors. Uh, so we're gonna use that data. Uh, we could, using that same summary function, uh, we could get some general data about, about these characters um, or about these variables. By the way, we could, using our, um, what we've learned about ggplot, since they're all numeric variables. Um, ooh, let's see if this is gonna work. Actually, I would have to pivot it. I wonder if I can do this real quickly. Pivot longer score through age names to variable. And I don't think I need, I don't think I, oh. There we go. Now I've got long data. Let me send that to ggplot and call my uh, x variable equals variable and my y equals value and geom box plot. Cross your fingers. You know, I this is similar to what happened here. Um, giving me some visual representation that I see in numbers here, the quantiles of the box plot, the first quantile, the last quantile, the median, the interquartile range. And if it's got outliers like that one does, it represents it as a dot. Um, I can use skimmer on that data. To look at that data, we've talked about this already. I can get a correlation of how score relates to beauty average. And in that case, it looks like, um, it, doesn't look like a particular, I think that's not a particularly strong um, correlation. Um, I can, there are different ways to get correlations. For example, if I go back to my Star Wars data, I get a correlation of mass to height, leaving out again, Bob, uh, Jabba the Hutt. Um, there's a much stronger correlation. Um, I can visualize some of that stuff. So making a scatter plot here, I'm using Geon Jitter which is a way to deal with, it's the same as, it's the same as geom point, but it, it repels points that are sitting on top of each other. So you can see clusters and then, um, and you can see that in this case, score and age are not particularly well correlated, they don't appear to be, um, but you can see these jitter, jitter clusters here are, the data, the underlying data has not changed, but the visual representation is repelled just enough so that you can see where there are clusters of data. Uh, there's another get correlation of age to score. And here we're gonna fit that model, right? So we're gonna, how does score get predicted by beauty average for the data evaluation? We're making that a linear model and we're putting it into an object called score model. And then if we use tidy score model, get our coefficients in a table. We can use glance to get our evaluation information, including the R squared, and we can use augment. And once it's in those tables, of course, not only can we manipulate with the plier, but we could manipulate it with um, ggplot as well. So 10 minutes to go. I know that was quick on regression, but that was the least uh, voted on, so. Help me know. Uh, Shital says, in the interactive bar plot, is there a way to show all variables in the data set or does it just show the ones we use for coding the plot? Um, well, it's just going to show so that I'm not sure. Let's go back to that one. Um, so 
Remember that what we did in this technique, what we did first is we just generated a bar plot. So putting interactive to the side for just a moment, um, we're only plotting one variable category. Um, and then we're using the variable state to make it a stacked plot. Uh, not that this is an, not that this is important, but let me um, let me at least clarify that part. Right, it's just a standard bar plot bar plot that we that we used a variable to set um, and make it stacked. Um, so when you say using all variables, remember that Midwest. Midwest has got a lot of variables in it, but we're not visualizing all of those variables. And the interactivity just is based on the plot that we generated. So I think I'm a little confused on the question. Um, the question was, uh, so if I understand correctly, that means it is just going to show the variables that we used for the code. If I were to say, if there was an extra variable in that data set called age, there is no way for me to tell the plot that show me age also. I don't want to code the age, but in that interactive window that pops out, it is a lovely feature, I feel. So I was just wondering if we can just add, you know, a label or extra something there, but. Oh, I think, hold on. There we go. So you can see here, I added, so is this what you mean by adding a label? I see how I add? That's helpful, yes, yes. Okay. So then let's see if, if I do that, let's see if I can, um, See if I can send that to G to uh, to to um, oops. GG plotly plot two. See if that label comes through. Not everything that you, yeah it did. So you can see what's happening there. So that's one way to add a label. Also, you can add labels. All right, so now if I turn that into a, a, a bar plot, AES state total pop, geom call. So I've got my bar plot there, and then I can add a label this way, label where uh, AES equals label equals uh, total pop. And you can add labels back.